Serious. Doctors of Reddit, what was the worst reaction, happy in a psychopathic way or sad, that you have ever gotten from telling someone their loved one has slash will die? Told an elderly patient that his lung cancer had metastasized to his brain and we weren't going to pursue further treatment. I asked if he wanted help telling his family and he said he's lived a good life and wanted to go on a fishing trip with just his son and he would tell him then. Had to hold back the tears on that one. I was a med student in a case where an 11-year-old child suddenly died during a routine orthopedic procedure for a broken arm. There were about 20 family members there with balloons and stuff. When the surgeon told them the news, they all started screaming and scattering, running in different directions around the hospital. One of them started clawing at me like a zombie. Definitely one of the most disturbing things I've ever witnessed. ER doc here. Told the wife her husband had a huge hemorrhagic stroke, unlikely to wake up. Screams, sobs, collapsing, then crushing chest pains. Now she's my patient too. Troponine echo, Kath showed she developed Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, aka broken heart syndrome, right in front of me. Your 95-year-old aunt is dying of lung cancer. There was a sudden emotional disproportionate amount of grief from her nephew, whom, from what I understood, was not that attached to his aunt. He was also her closest living relation. It's just not fair. I pause and let him continue speaking. My CMT is frowning, not really understanding where the conversation is now going. Bravely plowing on with the conversation, my CMT continues the dialogue through its pre-planned route. It could be days or weeks. She's currently got a very good appetite. Her nephew isn't really listening. He interjects, She chain-smoked, you know? Funny, isn't it? How you can smoke 50 cigarettes a day and nothing happens until you're almost 100. My wife never smoked. His voice trails off. My stomach does an uncomfortable twist. One look at my CMT who's looking at me like, What on earth is he talking about? I don't blame her, you know? She started smoking after her husband died. She was one of the factory workers in World War II. She was so close to her husband. They never had any children. But I asked her not to smoke around my wife. Roy Castle, you know, it killed him. Finally, it dawned on my CMT and myself. Sir, did your wife die of lung cancer? His eyes swell with tears, and we are both trying to be as professional as possible to not also start crying. It turned out the secondhand smoke exposure had caused his wife to pass away several years ago from lung cancer as they had allowed his aunt to live with them after his uncle passed away. His wife had never smoked in her life, and we were totally unprepared for the raw, angry grief he had so obviously pent up at his aunt for indirectly killing the love of his life. That, I think, was the most difficult breaking bad news I've ever had to do slash helped to do. Mostly because it was completely unexpected, and he was so raw, angry, inconsolable about his wife. Lesson learned. Smoking isn't worth it, and it's not just about you. A father who just found out his son had died from an overdose calmly went and sat in one of our empty ER rooms. He told an RN to admit him because, if I go home tonight, the family will have two funerals to plan. After a mandatory 72-hour hold in psych, he was released with a few new meds, which he used to kill himself. EMT here. Had a few of these, but the worst one I observed indirectly. We had a young woman in her 20s killed instantly in a high-speed collision. Same old story, car versus tree, the tree won. Girl was alone in the car, cold November night, a sad way to die. The crash was so bad that we thought we should have the car towed back to the firehouse so the FD could do the extrication behind closed doors. We figured she'd just come apart when the car was pulled away from her. But she stayed together, mostly, and they loaded her into our ambulance to go to the hospital to pronounce her... We were only basic EMTs, and pronouncement wasn't in our protocols. We get to the ER and park up front, outside of the bays usually reserved for ambulances to go back up into. No need to take up space with an already obviously dead patient. One of the ER docs came out to the ambulance and pronounced her there and told us to sit tight, the family was coming. Apparently, all they'd been told was their daughter had been in an accident and that they needed to get to the hospital right away. So we sat in the ambulance with the dead girl under a sheet. She was only a few years older than me, and I knew her vaguely from around town. It was weird. A pickup truck comes screaming into the ER parking lot a few minutes later, and a man and a woman about my parents' age come tumbling out before it even stops and goes running into the ER. The parents. A few minutes later, the lights in the family waiting room, which is right across the sidewalk from our ambulance, come on, and a nurse brings the parents in. We can't hear anything, but we can see the exchange. Have a seat, please. The doctor will be right with you. She leaves and closes the door, and we see the parents alone, terrified at what's to come. 
The mother is wringing her hands and pacing. The father is standing stiff and stoic. This is going to be bad. We can see the doc who pronounced her coming down the hall with a nurse and a social worker in tow. He gets to the door, hesitates a second, straightens his tie, and turns to the woman with him. We couldn't hear him, of course, but we knew he said, Ready? He opens the door and the parents whip around. We see him introduce himself and give a short speech. I'm sorry to tell you this, but your daughter died at the scene of the accident. The mother melted. I've never seen a human just dissolve like that, like her bones had suddenly turned to jelly. The father caught her before she hit the floor and he looked like he'd been hit with a sack of cement in the gut. He doubled over but held on to her, got her onto the couch, and we just sat there watching this horrible silent movie playing out in front of us. It felt crappy to intrude on their private moment and we talked about it in the cab of the ambulance. In a way, we felt like part of that family, at least for the short time that we took care of their daughter. We treated her body with as much respect as we could. We carefully transported her to the hospital so there would be no further damage, and we kept her safe while they were en route. And we made sure she was never alone. That was nearly 40 years ago, and that girl has been dead twice as long as she was alive. I think about her in that night every once in a while, and now that I'm a father of kids about that age, it's too painful to bear. That was only one of hundreds of accidents I responded to over my EMS and firefighting career, and it wasn't even the worst one. But it was the one that had the most impact on me, and I often wonder how that poor family coped with it. Explain to a husband that after his wife was struck by a car crossing the street, there was significant bleeding in her abdomen. Despite my operative attempt, his wife died on the table. I was very sorry for his loss. He nodded and asked, Okay. Thanks. When do you think she will be ready to go home? He completely blocked out everything I said. So many traumatic events, it's hard to recall all the details or to pick one, but this one was different. No trauma, no emergency. We told this friendly guy of his diagnosis that will kill him soon, weeks to months, then asked who we should talk to or who can be his guardian. He only had his boss from his recent job. No family, no friends. He was all alone. His boss visited once early on. I thought about that a lot. Still do. So here's a weird one that's stuck with me. Had a patient in his 50s die in a single room on the ward while surrounded by his Portuguese family. Mostly women, wife, sisters, in-laws, all their 40s at least. We knew he was deteriorating and had no plans to resuscitate if and when he died. A few days into his admission, he passed away while the family were visiting. I get called in by the nurse to confirm the death and everyone in the room is completely silent and watching me. I confirm what they already know and everyone just mobs me, hugging me, kissing my hand, kissing my cheek, and thanking me profusely for looking after their relatives. Not what I was expecting at all. It was like a sudden collective release of tension in the room. Somehow I think they were just relieved he wasn't suffering anymore. I was a corpsman working an EMT response to a car crash, and a dude's twin brother was the one who was dying in a ditch after having the top of his head ripped in half by the top of the car. The surviving twin looked like his soul was gone, like everything in his life was meaningless. That's the best way I could put it. The rest of the family and friends were all distraught and crying, but he looked like he was going to drop dead from grief. The patient was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of brain cancer. He was attending college far from where he grew up and was accompanied by his best friend since his family were so far away. While telling him the options for treatment and expected prognosis, his buddy said, So, if you die, can I have your stereo? The patient laughed pretty hard and cursed him out. Had a patient who was flown in from far away with a non-survivable accidental burn. The only family member at the hospital was an adult child who had a very appropriate response when I told them, shock, disbelief, sadness, denial, etc. The patient's spouse was still at home hours away. I called the spouse and told them about the nature of the burn, the need to get to the hospital ASAP to say goodbyes, etc. The response was, okay, thank you, doctor. Most people are frantic, but this person was completely calm and more concerned about getting the house cleaned up. The patient surprisingly made it through the night, and the family brought the spouse to the hospital the next morning. I was able to talk to the spouse and realize that when the patient left the house with the paramedics, the spouse knew that there was no way the patient would survive. I was just confirming what they already knew, that they were losing their partner of almost 40 years. They seemed more concerned about the house because they just couldn't bear to look at the footprints burned into the carpet anymore. Was still a student at the time on rotation in the ICU. We were on morning rounds and had just finished discussing a patient that had passed away the night before and it turns out the family hadn't been informed yet. 
So, of course, the family shows up to check on their loved one and had to be given the sad news in front of a large group of ogling residents and students. In my opinion, they were also informed in quite a cold and clinical way, the word expired being used in lieu of a softer descriptive and just an overall absence of compassion. The son proceeded to lose his mind. He started yelling, threatening staff, and eventually ended up punching and shattering a computer screen and had to be removed by security. Honestly, I don't blame him. Best was talking with the family matriarch, strong businesswoman whose children had taken over several businesses in the town. Very rich, influential family. We originally admitted her as a stroke, but on further review found multiple brain metastases. Family wanted everything done. This was a mentally alert woman who at 94 they wanted to have chemo and surgery. I discussed her options with her, including no aggressive treatment. She was elected for this. She went into hospice and died peacefully a few months later. She asked what I would do. Having just gone through this with my grandmother and grandfather the year before, I gave her both sides of the story. Doing everything and buying a few months but dealing with surgery and illness, or just pursuing comfort measures. I think she was happy with the decision. I think the family was upset with me for giving her that option. Child with congenital lupus. The family had refused more treatment. Kid was on 24-7 dialysis and needed a kidney. We told parents that without the kidney transplant, their child would die. They told us they had faith their child would live without the kidney. Parents were wrong. Nurse here. I worked in an ICU, so when I have to phone someone to tell them their loved one's status changed or they have passed, it's generally traumatic and unexpected, as compared to, say, a palliative unit where families know it's coming. I had a patient who was not intubated, rare in ICU, and just a genuinely nice guy. I talked to him most of my night shift about his family, life, etc., I came back from my break at 3 a.m. and I heard my break relief partner yelling, Get the crash cart! I had a bad feeling about this guy, so I kind of expected this, but obviously the family did not. Calling his son to say, You need to pick up your mother and get here as soon as possible was hard enough. But calling him back to say, I'm so sorry, but despite our best efforts, your father did not make it was awful. This is a grown man. I heard his phone drop to the floor and he started sobbing to his wife and muttering incoherently between sobs. I didn't know if he was going to pick up the phone again, so I stayed on the line to listen for a bit. Heartbreaking. I work in an ICU, so I often have to tell families bad news. The most recent memory was a daughter telling me, this must be the hardest part of your job. I was taken back just because, despite the tragedy she was enduring, she still had the ability to empathize with what I also had to do. Being blamed. This lady was visiting the area with her friends when she began having heavy vag bleeding. I told the patient that it is always concerning when a postmenopausal woman has bleeding. Furthermore, she had a copious necrotic tumor falling out of her uterus as well. I told her that until the pathologist looks at it under the microscope, we won't know for sure, but this is concerning for cancer. Long story short, it takes days for the final read to come back, but she stabilized and went home in the meantime. Unfortunately, the pathology came back as a rare and aggressive form of cancer. I was no longer involved in her care, but was sorry to hear about the diagnosis. As a courtesy, I called her to make sure she had all the information and had what she needed before going to see the gynecologist. She tells me, Oh, I thought you were calling to apologize. I'll never forget you telling me that you think I have cancer. It's part of the stages of grief, denial, anger, etc., but it still hurt that I went out of my way to check in on her and she responded with so much anger and blame. True. Until we have a diagnosis, we can't say if it is X or Y, which I told her, but we owe it to the patients when we have a serious concern that we have to share that info with them. Anything less is unethical. Thankfully, I wasn't the only one in the room, but we spent three hours on and off explaining to a family that we couldn't transfer their deceased child to another hospital. I think they believe the kid was in a vegetative state and that we just gave up on them, instead of the reality that their kid was dead. When I was a pediatrics resident working in the neonatal intensive care unit, a sense of twins were delivered way too early. The parents had already given names to twin A and twin B. They both survived delivery, but twin B died overnight. When we broke the terrible news to them, they were appropriately devastated, but the thing that always stuck me as weird is what they did next. They decided to switch names so that the twin that lived had the name they liked more. I often think back on the twin that died and how sad that all was. Patient was told she had breast cancer. Happiest day of her life. Chronic hypochondriac in the ER daily, the smile on her face when she found out she was actually sick was horrifying. 
Nursing assistant saw him a bit down the chain of command, but still relevant. Had this Lithuanian couple come into the ED, they couldn't speak a word of English. They'd come on one last holiday before their baby came, except they were rushed straight off the plane into an ambulance as the woman had severe abdo cramps and heavy bleeding. The doctor had to translate that the baby had died. I will honestly never forget those screams for the rest of my career. Like blood-curdling, pure, heartbroken screams from both of them. Honestly, the whole day, every single staff member just was so shaken and upset. And it's not like we've never had people die. Frick, even kids die, but... I don't know, just the sheer, pure heartbreak? They were destroyed. It was not really that bad, but while I was talking to a spouse through termination of resuscitation, stopping CPR, they kept trying to justify the termination by asking, if they come back, they would be brain dead, right? And they kept asking, despite multiple polite redirects, about how the patient was still in the systole despite our interventions, and was most certainly not coming back. Eventually, it got to the point where I gently but somewhat firmly had to say, for us to worry about the PT being brain dead, they need to stop being dead dead, and that's not going to happen. Fortunately, a close friend was on scene and able to get that message through. I was at a delivery where both mom and baby were having problems. As we were saving the baby, the OR team was trying to save the mom. We did, they didn't. As we were leaving with the baby to the NICU, the OR doc was telling dad and his family that his wife didn't make it. He saw his baby and asked when mom could begin breastfeeding. Grandma fell to the floor crying, but dad just had this look like he was just waking up and not hearing what was going on. Seeing him visit the NICU was just so sad. You could see him trying to hold it all in while visiting his baby. One of my patients had squamous cell carcinoma in situ on his left that I caught early and was actually removed entirely in the biopsy. We still wanted him to get topical chemotherapy on the area to make sure we got everything. For those unaware, it's like a lotion and mostly only has local skin side effects. It was actually good news, but I wanted to reinforce that he's at a higher risk of developing new cancers and it's possible that his children have the same genetic predisposition. So he needs to make sure he and his kids need to be using sunscreen and lip balm with sunscreen in it, plus six-month follow-up. He was a native Spanish speaker, but his English seemed above average, so I didn't want to use a translator if I didn't have to. Well, judging from the years and how upset he was, I guess I misjudged his English skills. He did a good job at picking up the buzzwords. He heard cancer, more cancer, chemotherapy, and his children have a higher chance of getting cancer. But he missed all the important context. He thought he was going to die and his kids were too. I quickly got a translator and explained everything again. He was still distraught over the emotional roller coaster moments ago, but he understood what was going on. So my worst reaction was a wrong reaction because I fricked up. Deputy here. I've been to quite a few deaths and I've only seen one that was happy. The husband was a lifetime alcoholic and was on hospice for various related illnesses. When we arrived, he was DOA. She told us he went to go to the bathroom, gasped, and literally dropped dead. She was at first sad. The more she talked about him, we could tell he was a real bastard. She pretty much couldn't make a move without him. He wouldn't let the grandkids come over, and they lived next door. When the funeral home came to collect the body, they had difficulty getting him loaded up. The wife remarked, Even dead, he still finds a way to be a pain. I couldn't help but grin when she said it. Previous nursing assistant on a respiratory ward. Elderly male patient decided to willingly opt out of the respiratory support machine. Lovely man. His time inevitably came around six hours later early in the morning. His granddaughter, young girl around mid-twenties, the only family member in the hospital at the time, was so devastated she climbed into the bed with him and wouldn't leave the ward. Endless crying, shrieking, and asking for her granddad to wake up. Heartbreaking stuff. Staff and doctors tried to coerce her to take some time outside, but she wouldn't leave the bed. Eventually, the rest of the family arrived and talked her out, but took a good few hours. Male patient, mid to late 20s, heavy drug user, meningitis. Coded at about 3 a.m. His ex-wife, recently so, I think, and mother were there. The mother started crying, but the ex-wife just freaking exploded. Her face just kind of broke. She kept screaming and crying while rotating positions, lying on the ground, pushing against the nurse's station, sitting while grabbing her head, kneeling while grabbing me. Eventually, the mom couldn't handle it. Had a hypertensive crisis, and we sent her to the ED. The ex-wife just got sort of catatonic and followed her there. The worst thing is that if you weren't hearing her screams, it would have looked kind of funny. 
After that, I never had trouble breaking news to a family. And don't try to take ciprofloxacin without water. I still remember the taste. Excuse the bad English. Told a husband that his wife, suffering with severe Alzheimer's, was unlikely to survive an episode of pneumonia, but that we would be giving intravenous antibiotics and fluids. He begged us not to, saying that her quality of life was awful and that we don't make animals live through end-stage diseases and suffer the way she was suffering. Obviously, without an advanced care plan in place, there was nothing we could do except continue to initially give maximum medical therapy. It was pretty harrowing. I don't want to say I've seen any way which someone can react, because I'll see one in a month or a year I never thought I would see. Had a 60-plus-year-old man a few weeks ago, came to the ED for abdominal pain and CT, found a 10-centimeter mass in his pancreas. Always had a smile on his face, joked with me while he was in the hospital. Thanked myself and my resident team every time I was in the room or walked by and he called me in for our help. It's amazing how some people feel a sense of calm when you try to hold back your own emotions when telling someone they likely have seen their last Christmas. Saw six to seven family members in a room when grandpa slash dad was coding, taking different routes. One in the corner crying, one in the corner just staring at compressions, one trying to fight the chaplain, and one refusing to leave the bedside while screaming at dad to live. He didn't make it. As a resident in the ICU, we had a 30-something male, code around 5 o'clock. Brought him back after about 30 minutes or so. Problem was, he started to code after about 30 minutes. Compressions and another round of epi, and he would come back just to do it all over again. With each code overheard, the family would just stand up, walk outside, and sit on chairs they brought outside the room. No emotion, no tears, just had this look that he came back before and will again. My attending in-house was an old Air Force crit care doc and told the family after five cycles of this that it was torture to continue. They disagreed. I signed out to the oncoming residents and heard they finally let him die around 11 o'clock. In my state, we have to wait 48 hours after deciding to withdraw care. After a few days, the patient's wife of 50-plus years decided to withdraw care. She couldn't help but feel she was killing her husband. He had a previous surgery to remove a lung, and his one remaining lung had terrible pneumonia that wasn't improving. He went into VTAC and died two hours before we were to remove the tube. I've never seen a weight lifted off a family member like this since she told me. He knew I couldn't do it, so he did it himself. The one I will never forget is the withdrawal of care of a 17-year-old. He was driving home from football practice with his little brother and flipped his car. He had a TBI and never regained consciousness. Brother didn't have a scratch. The dad was a mess but then thanked us for our care and respect after about four days. I will never forget the hatred and look the mom gave any medical staff in that room. I never heard her say one word. We were the team who couldn't and wouldn't save her son. She walked out when we brought up organ donation. My second branch as a resident was on a brain-dead 17-year-old, so we could see how good his lungs were for donation. The organ donation group sent me a letter a month later thanking me for my service. It stated the approximate age of each organ recipient, what organ they received, and what their hobbies are. I have that letter framed and hanging up in my house. I was working in the burn unit. Guy comes in, MVC head on collision. The other driver was wasted and crossed lanes. His wife was killed in the crash. Every time he woke up, he asked where his wife was and he had to be told. He would just start saying, 42 years and sobbing. I can't imagine what it was like for that guy having to remember every single time you wake up. He was in a lot of pain, aka lots of Dilaudid, which contributed to his confusion. Slowly over time, it sank in. Very heartbreaking to watch. The ones that really stick out are the people who take the news with quiet dignity. I had one patient present with dermatomyositis. 20% of people with this have an underlying malignancy. I told the patient and family this and asked if they wanted to look. They said yes. Did a CT scan? Showed multifocal tumor burden in the liver. Biopsy showed pancreatic adenocarcinoma, unfortunately. So METS to the liver equals stage 4. Broke the news to the patient and her family, and her response was, Thank you for telling me. That must have been really hard for you to do. Pancreatic adenocarcinoma seems to always take the most gentle people. I'm pretty late to the party, but my sister is an RN who used to work in a nursing home. She told me a story of how an elderly woman and her husband lived in the nursing home together and had been married for 50-plus years. They were practically attached at the hip. 
He was in poor health, and she was a nurse for a long time before retiring. One day in the cafeteria, he had a massive heart attack while they were eating, and she was begging the nurses to help her save him. But the guy had a DR, and there was nothing the nurse could do but let him pass. The worst part was that she, being a former nurse, tried her best to give him CPR, but she was far too weak to help anything. Were. Ooh boy, this is one of my favorite stories to tell my trainees. TLDR, I saw pretty much all the emotions and stages of grief in one 15-minute session. I was a second-year resident in family medicine doing an ICU rotation in a pretty big city downtown major hospital. One night, we admitted a guy with sickle cell who developed acute chest syndrome and decompensated quickly. That night, we worked to stabilize him, and he held on okay. I told the family if his lungs hold up, there's a chance he could do okay. I went home past call and came back to him in multi-system failure, lungs giving out with essentially nothing left to do. The attendings love to have us Navy family medical docs do the talk with families. We must have been good at it. Since I knew the family already, they were ecstatic to have me back and said, you're up. I took a second year medicine resident with me to get a feel for the process, and the attending took us to the family room to talk. There were about 20 to 30 family members there, all ages and types. The POA was his daughter, who didn't know him too well, but was the closest relative as parents and wife had already passed. I started to tell them the news. That thing I had mentioned about the lungs holding out? Well, unfortunately, they aren't anymore, and nothing else is either. The four medicines to keep his heart pumping won't work much longer. We need to talk about what to do. They said, pull the plug, and I said, yes, maybe. The handful of young girls that weren't the POA all started crying. One actually took off running and screaming down the hall. The men in their teens and twenties started swearing under their breath and congregated in the corner, staring daggers at me, and I'm sure planning on how to make sure the same thing happened to me as their family member. I'm guessing around then the other resident and attending sink into the room kind of like Homer through the shrub because I was by myself for the rest of the event. I tried getting the daughter to make a decision. Reasonably, she couldn't. So she kicked me over to one of his cousins. The middle-aged folk were arguing, each with their own opinion and knowing everyone else was wrong. No one could agree except that I was wrong and I didn't know what I was talking about and I lied to them the other night. They eventually punted to the next generation. His aunt was there with a few older folks sitting in a corner. She was far more reserved and realized the situation and came to terms with it pretty quickly. She thought it was best not to let him suffer, so tried convincing the daughter to sign the paper. But the daughter couldn't bring herself to do it and started crying. After a few minutes more chatting, crying, and arguing, another guy I had not seen yet started proselytizing. I just had a talk with Brother Ben the other day about this exact thing. He knew he was in bad shape, and soon he would go back to Jesus. It was apparently the family's pastor, and he started preaching. With each sentence, another person joined the circle around me, the POA, and the preacher until everyone was back. With each mention of Ben and Jesus, there was another amen or hallelujah until everyone was yelling the joys of God. Finally, the daughter said, yes, let's do it, to a resounding praise Jesus. We signed the papers after about 15 minutes of all this. I found the other two docs in the corner, the other resident bug-eyed and quiet. In the hall, the intensive care attending of over 12 years said, Well, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. And I know he had seen a lot already. That ICU is crazy, and I have quite a few other stories from just a month there. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.